Welcome from CVI 2017. I'm Dr. Michael Luna here with Dr. Grant Reed from the Cleveland Clinic, who will be talking about a complex CLI case, combined anterograde and retrograde approach. Wonderful. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a, a privilege to be able to uh, speak to you here at CVI. So let's get started. Uh, this is a case of a 71-year-old female who was referred to us for leg pain and ulcerations. Um, at our initial clinic visit, she had extensive left-sided lower extremity ulcerations and minimal uh, right lower extremity ulcerations um, with rest pain, uh, severe bilateral lower extremity edema. Uh, this is weeping. It's, it smelled foul. Uh, this is all consistent with Rutherford uh, 6 uh, critical limb ischemia. Uh, as is common with patients with critical limb ischemia, she had many comorbidities, including ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, prior bypass operation with vein harvesting of the lower extremities, uh, low flow, low grain aortic valve stenosis, untreated diabetes, uh, and morbid obesity. Uh, and this uh, played significantly into her presentation. Her BMI was upwards of uh, 58. Uh, so certainly one of the largest uh, CLI patients that we've treated. Um, she was on all guideline uh, appropriate medications, um, including dual antiplatelet therapy, which was for a recently placed coronary stent, um, and uh, had a strong family history of coronary disease and uh, 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 cerebral vascular incident. So uh, I, I don't have pictures of the wounds. However, just paint a picture for you. Uh, her left lower extremity was severely ulcerated uh, from the left hallux to the dorsum of the foot involving uh, kissing ulceration of the fourth and fifth digits. Um, this was uh, rather deep, um, even involved the anterior aspect of the shin. Uh, the right lower extremity, as mentioned, had superficial ulceration of the right hallux, so pretty minor, um, and three to four plus lower extremity edema from the shins, um, really the knees down to the feet. Uh, so, uh, you know, some uh, certainly dealing with um, uh, lower extremity edema and likely a multifactorial wound in this case. Um, relevant lab, just to point out, their hemoglobin A1C uh, was uh, upwards of 11, uh, and her, surprisingly, her cranny was normal. Uh, so, the wound was in the uh, angiosome of the dorsalis pedis, anterior tibial predominantly, uh, but just pretty extensive overall. Um, so she had a venous ultrasound just to make sure that we weren't missing another cause of the edema and the wound, uh, did not have a DVT, um, and I'll briefly show her uh, lower extremity non-invasive perfusion uh, testing here, and you see her PVRs uh, on uh, the right side and even the left side uh, do show that there's some element of non-compressibility here. Um, so the ABI um, on the left side was, was not compressible, and the PT and the DP um, was 0.64 and TBI was 0.17. Uh, so certainly not a normal um, ABI, but again, as is common with patients with CLI, a third of patients will have somewhat normal uh, ankle brachial index testing. So it's not at 100% reliable. It doesn't tell you the whole story in this case. So we admitted her to have an expedited evaluation uh, from a multidisciplinary wound care team. I want to get on top of this very quickly. Uh, she was seen by infectious disease who uh, agreed that this was osteomyelitis and put her on uh, IV antibiotics, podiatry to debride um, the necrosed tissue and give her appropriate wound care regimen, endocrinology to get on top of her diabetes, and she was aggressively diuresed. So at this point, uh, we made a decision that she's you know, gonna uh, need angiography. And as mentioned, she had um, uh, ex extreme obesity. Uh, so a femoral approach in this case um, was going to be uh, somewhat prohibitive. And you can see here, just, just from the DSA angio, you can, you can see you know, the, the, the adiposity here that, that we're struggling with. Um, so we, um, to begin with, thought that we would take uh, a, uh, an uh, an, uh, potentially an anagrade, but a retrograde approach. So we first tried to get access via the DP on the left side, um, trying to give us as much reach as possible um, to the lesions, which we were thinking would, would likely be um, you know, below the knee in this case. Uh, however, we wanted to obviously get good angiography first. Um, our attempt to get um, dorsalis pedis access was not successful. Um, uh, so in that case, uh, we uh, resorted to left brachial access, knowing that we may not be able to reach all below the knee, but we would reevaluate things as the case went. So this is from the left brachial. This is angiography uh, through a, a six by 90 uh, rabies uh, sheath. Uh, and as you can see here, there's a disease in the superficial uh, femoral artery on the left side. And uh, a shot further down shows that there's disease on the distal SFA and the popliteal, 
um, as well as below the knee. Uh, and uh, this doesn't show, I'll just for the sake of time, not show it beyond this point, uh, but you can see that there's disease um, in the, uh, uh, there's some disease in the anterior tibial, the, the peroneal is patent, but the posterior tibial is completely occluded. And below this point, um, you see there's one vessel run off to the foot, um, and that's actually the peroneal, which is uh, reconstituting the anterior tibial, which is occluded, uh, and then the, um, the posterior uh, tibial artery uh, fills via collaterals in the foot. Uh, so we first started uh, by trying to address the SFA uh, inflow uh, issue. Uh, so this is a five by uh, 120 uh, sterling balloon. Uh, which uh, we balloon the SFA via the left um, brachial. And this is over, um, I believe, a, a woolly wire at this point. Uh, and uh, our initial result, you know, it, it didn't show a whole lot of difference, um, but there, there was still flow. And at this point, we made a decision that we're going to have to get all the way down to the popliteal, how we're having difficulty advancing equipment. Because as mentioned from the brachial, um, you know, we, there's a challenge reaching all the way down there. And even if you do get down there, uh, there's severe disease that you have to contend with. You may not get enough support. So in this case, uh, knowing that the um, uh, dorsalis pedis access on the left side was not successful, we decided to uh, achieve uh, left anterior tibial access. So this was done under fluoroscopy. Um, and uh, you can see this was a micropuncture access. Uh, there's a, um, nav a navy cross in the popliteal there. Uh, and uh, we were able to get access and advance a, 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 a platinum plus uh, a wire up to the navy cross and then externalize that. And that creates a nice firm rail which you can work from the um, anagrade, uh, left brachial sheath. Uh, and we just put a hemostat at the level of the skin just to create a nice firm uh, rail for us to work over. And, and that allowed us to advance uh, balloon further down into the popliteal. Uh, this was also a, a, a five by 120 uh, balloon, and working, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, more proximal into the popliteal and the SFA. Uh, you can see that we we, we do start to make uh, we do start to make some progress here. Um, uh, there's some element of dissection here too, so and we want to treat this more effectively. At this point, we use um, uh, an, an impact. Uh, Admiral drug coated balloon, uh, a six by 150, uh, to uh, try to open this up a little bit better. And as you can see here, uh, we're starting to make some progress. And I don't, I'm not sure if I have the image here, uh, but there was, you know, still some residual stenosis into the popliteal, some concern for dissection, and it, it became uh, evident that this patient would be best treated with stent. Um, so uh, a self-expanding superior stent uh, can be delivered in this case, but again, giving issues with support and, and reach, um, you know, doing that from the brachial uh, is a little bit more challenging. So in this case, we, we have access in the anterior tibial, uh, but it's just a wire, which is externalized. So we place the sheath um, in the anterior tibial. Uh, this was a slender sheath, uh, which um, went over um, uh, the, the wire, which we had externalized. This is Platinum Plus we're working over. Uh, and as you can see here, this is when the sheath is in, there's a bit of a blush there. This is not uncommon. Uh, you can have a, a, a small amount of um, you know, hemorrhage into the soft tissue, but that's something which you can address at the end of the case. It's pretty minor in this case, but we're certainly aware of it. So uh, I, I won't show this entire uh, deployment of the stent because it takes a little bit over a minute, but it's on the uh, what it, it, basically what we did is we deployed this 5.5, uh, I believe, by 120 superior stent uh, from the um, you know, distal um, SFA popliteal uh, down to the, um, the junction of the distal popliteal anterior tibial. And, and we overall had great success with this. This was uh, successful. Uh, and as you can see here, um, we are at this point sealing up the uh, spot that we want in the anterior tibial with a 3-0 uh, balloon, and we uh, reduce for about 10 minutes with external compression just to seal up the spot that we want in. Uh, so here's some completion angiography uh, of uh, the um, popliteal, uh, AT, and peroneal, and you can see that we have a much you know, better result than uh, what we started with. And not the best shot of the foot at the end here because the patient was, was moving and at this point getting a little uncomfortable. But you can see that um, you know, there's, there's good flow uh, to the foot um, as well. 
So a summary of our case uh, for the, those who you know, are able to uh, see our, our slides online, uh, just to describe it for you, this was really a combination of both anti-grade and retrograde approaches. So uh, our post-procedure hemodynamics, our ABI remained non-compressible. Not gonna fix that with, with ballooning, unfortunately, but the TBI did improve from 0.17 to 0.51, and there were biphasic pulses not present in both the dorsal pedis and the post posterior tibial, uh, which we thought was interesting. We kept her on dual line plate therapy for her stents, um, as well as for the superum, um, and then uh, she was put on antibiotics for 10 days by ID, and then had uh, appropriate uh, wound care follow-up. Uh, her wounds, which were extensive to begin with, um, had uh, fully healed uh, within four months' time. So, and also just to illustrate, it takes time for these things to heal if they've been there for a while. A uh, major part of this was uh, diuresing her and uh, you know, keeping uh, the fluid off of her legs as well. So uh, this was a case of chronic unhealed wounds that were multifactorial in etiology. And the lower extremity edema was due to a combination of, at this point, diastolic heart failure, uh, lower extremity vein harvesting, and, and obesity, but, and, and you know, diabetes, which contributes to microvascular dysfunction. But without proper perfusion to the leg, it's um, an next impossible to heal these wounds. Uh, so with that, we were able to make some progress. Uh, this was treated successfully with interdisciplinary care, but also endovascular therapy using integrated and retrograde approaches when appropriate. This can be very successful. And this case, I think, illustrates the importance of management of comorbidities in the multidisciplinary wound care team. So. That's great. That, that is a great case. Um, you know, one of our instincts always in, in CLI cases where, where, where tissue loss is, a, is an issue is to uh, uh, maximize the blood flow as much as possible, as you know. And uh, a lot of us would have been tempted to also try to recanalize the um, enter tibial distally. Um, and and uh, it sounds like the femoral approach is going to be a big limit. It, it, it ended up being the biggest limitation for, for this case. Um, was there any consideration for uh, an anterior um, a stick into the anterior tibial in the same spot that you, you accessed this I think that's, that's a great point, and I didn't you know, get into that too much here, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, just to focus on, on the, the procedure uh, that, that we did. But uh, we want to take a stepwise approach, and this was what we felt to be step one of this process. Process. Um, however, if her wounds weren't to heal, uh, you know, we, we did have a reasonable luck, you know, with, you know, anterior tibial access. And uh, we, as, as you say, we, we could definitely have taken an anti-grade approach and, uh, you know, uh, went after the anterior tibial uh, distal to where it occluded. So that, that's something which is, uh, you, you have plan A, you have plan B, and you have plan C. And then you, you take it stepwise and you, it's, at times you, you do the lowest hanging fruit first. In this case, um, we learned a lot just from the challenges going from the, the, the brachial, uh, and I think if we needed to adjust uh, her perfusion in the future, you know, we, we have a whole armamentarium of things we can do in the future, and that's definitely something which is on the table. Absolutely. Uh, for our audience, just so that we get um, a little uh, idea of how you, um, um, how you approach compression of um, accesses outside of our usual accesses. So how is it that you all uh, apply pressure to, to the anterior tibial that's stick? That's a great question. So the, uh, the anterior tibial uh, stick, um, it's in general very safe. Uh, the incidence of compartment syndrome is low. Uh, however, uh, when you have angiographic blush, um, uh, I think it's important to be careful with it. Uh, so um, there are many different schools of thought about what the best approach is. Um, you can't just inflate a blood pressure cuff and just try to tamponade it. Uh, if you, know, you still have access uh, at a different point, which you almost always will, in this case, the blood brachial sheath allowed us to take contrast injection after one minute, after five minutes, and then after 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, after the first minute, we could tell things you know, were not improving much. At five minutes, they weren't improving much. So we actually just went up with a uh, balloon. And this was a 3.0 by 120, um, just you know, uh, old, you know, a, a typical balloon. Uh, and the combination of that with the external compression, uh, it actually uh, sealed up within an additional five minutes. But without that balloon, it would we weren't making much progress. And again, it's just a stepwise uh, uh, approach. And the things that you don't want to do is get too aggressive with reversing your anticoagulant. Um, if you reverse protamine, then especially with the freshly put, uh, placed stent. Um, you can run into trouble with that thrombosing and such. So um, you just let the heparin drift down with the balloon occlusion and the external compression. Uh, the combination of those two things are successful in our case. 
And, and uh, how many millimeters of mercury do you normally uh, fill the... Sure, and I brushed over some of those details here, but all of our balloon inflations were, were to nominal uh, pressure, which was eight atmospheres. Most of our balloon inflations were for two, for two minutes mm -hmm. apiece. Um, what about and, the blood pressure cuff uh, externally? Sure, so uh, you, in general, you just want it to be a, 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 at least 20 millimeters above uh, you know, your systemic pressure. Um, you don't want to go crazy with it, uh, and it, it can be uncomfortable for the patient as well, so uh, you want to uh, be mindful of that, but uh, you want to be able to ma maintain uh, hemostasis. And with the balloon up, actually, the, um, the blood pressure externally compressing, the, the cuff doesn't need to be quite as high, uh, but in this case, uh, we, had, we had immediate good, re good result with that. Great. All right. Thank you so much. That's a great case. All right. All right. Signing off from CVI 2017.